Hi everyone, thank you very much for watching. Today I have the absolute pleasure of talking with the snowman, which is going to be the coolest name in fighting, Jeff Monson, who is two-time Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu World Champion in ADCC Submission Wrestling, also Nogai Jiu-Jitsu World Champion as well, has competed in MMA since 1997, something you don't hear every day, um, over 20 years, has had 88 professional fights, 61 wins, has competed in just about every MMA promotion on the planet, including the UFC, Strike Force, Dream, um, Pride, M1 Global, Impact FC, and quite a few others. Um, is an eight-time gold medalist. That's right, champ, eight-time gold medalist in, in jiu-jitsu, or is there more than that? Oh, man, I, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> like, <laughs> Let's go with that. Let's go with that. So yeah. many doesn't remember them all. Uh, eight-time gold medalist, um, three-time silver, and one-time bronze, possibly more guys. Um, there's a lot of achievements there. And I've got to give this a quick mention, champ, before we get going. Some of the people you shared an octagon with, absolutely incredible. Obviously, Fedor Emelianenko, Alexander Emelianenko, obviously his brother, um, Satoshi Ishii, uh, I've written them down in so many, uh, Travis Fulton, uh, Roy Nelson, Pedro Rizzo, Josh Barnett. I mean, some of the guys, Tim Sylvia, Chuck Liddell. I mean, some of the guys you've been in there with, absolutely incredible. Um, I think we've also got other world titles here, XFC, um, world champion, Cage Warriors, heavyweight world champion, um, ISKA world champion as well. Uh, I didn't know that one until, until researching for this interview and quite a lot more. So, But the one thing I do want to mention for our viewers before we get going is that Jeff is much more than a fighter. He is an incredible human being. Excuse me talking about you in third person, Jeff, I know it's a little bit weird, but um, he is an incredible human being um, who is a humanitarian. Is probably too simple a term, but um, Jeff is somebody who is contributing back to the world in an incredible way, currently building um, an orphanage in Russia, which we'll get back to in a minute, currently doing a lot of work with children with cancer, children uh, without parents or who are orphaned, um, working with the hospice house as well, and quite a few other ventures. Um, very spiritual person, and that is one of the things I'm very keen to um, get into today as well, Jeff, is some of your amazing work outside of fighting and how you are so much more than a fighter, um, because I think people tend to, to pigeonhole some athletes, don't they, in terms of, you know. So that's, um, that's a little bit longer and a little bit different to my usual introduction, but I hope I've covered everything there. Um, and one thing I would like to say is thank you for obviously taking the time to talk to me, Jeff. I really do appreciate it, by the way. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, cool. I mean, right. So starting at the beginning then, uh, or not literally the beginning, but um, where I'd like to start this. Obviously, you're American born and raised. OK. Um, and you've always had an affinity with Russia. You've always had a very strong pull towards Russia. You've always felt... Um, Russian in spirit is one phrase that, um, that I, I've come across, you know, that you said. So really, I want to highlight that because obviously that's where you currently live um, and things of that nature. So when did you first become aware of that? Where did it start for you um, in your awareness of having an affinity with um, Russia as a country and as a culture and the people there and all of those things? Where did that start? Well, I mean, my first memory of Russia, I guess, was in like grade school. And like, I think I was, we were doing a study about the Cuban Missile Crisis. <clears throat> and I was like, you know, and obviously at this time in the 80s, it was, you know, American versus Russia, communist versus capitalist. You know, and it was like, you know, at the Olympics, at the World Champions, you know, I was big into sports. So it was always a competition with the Russians. So I became, obviously, they're the enemy. So I became like, it was just like an intrigue, you know, intriguement with who are these Russians? You know, we, got, we saw Russian in the movies, always portraying them as these stern, tall, strong, you know, wrestling the bears and drinking vodka, you know, so I was, I was interested, but, you know, obviously not someplace I wanted to go live or something. Um, then when I became um, kind of politically turned, I became um, awakened politically, um, then the Russian Revolution, like the October Revolution, 1917, and, and how even Karl Marx didn't uh, understand or like guess that the first and only social revolution in the world would happen in backwards agrarian Russia. And um, so I, I, I started to have an affinity for Russia and uh, 
a deep respect that they, um, you know, they rose up again throughout the czar and, and, you know, started this revolution that still has a huge impact on the world today. And um, so this is, you know, how I first became like interested in, in respecting Russia. But it wasn't until, you know, my visits here and the first time I came, I fought the door. Um, and then I had subsequent, you know, five subsequent uh, appearances and meetings and appearances and master classes and this. And um, it just, it happened um, over time that I realized I want to live here. But um, it was kind of early on with this, um, my, with my social, my political awakening that I, I felt there was something that um, about the Russian people that I, I deeply admired. Powerful answer. It's a powerful answer. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, right. So before we get more into that, because some of the political stuff and some of the other things I would like to, to touch on later. But before we do, obviously, I need to give a mention to the work you're doing um, right now, you know, that we've been talking about before this interview. And you, you told me a bit about it. I think it's incredible. Um, absolutely so profoundly moving and I, I, I really mean that champ. So you're currently building an orphanage, um, as I mentioned in the intro, you're currently involved with children with cancer. I find it interesting because, you know, you seem to have been involved in helping people for a long time. I mean, because um, even going back to uh, working as a mental health professional years ago before your fighting career and things and you know, it, I think it's always been there. So I'm going to open this up a little bit big. I'd like to talk about the work you're doing now, but I'd also like to give a mention to where the inspiration for helping people comes from, if that makes sense, because it, it seems that it's always been a part of you, but um, I don't know, I'd like to hear in your own words. But let's start with what you're doing right now in terms of building the orphanage. Can you tell us a little bit about that and a bit about how it's going and um, what the process is and obviously um, where you're building it as well and just just a little run through if that's okay, please, champ. Well, um, you know, I've, I've wanted to be involved uh, um, politically in Russia because um, you know, I've done a lot of like little volunteer stuff, come and visit an orphanage, come visit children at a hospital, come because I've, um, you know, of course I feel like very good about doing this and I feel, you know, it's something that it's a two way street and they're, they're excited to have me there. Um, but I'm, I'm also excited too, because, you know, people are like, they, I see their kids excitement. And so of course it makes me excited and feel good about the fact that I'm there, that, that I can do something even if a very small, you know, for a very small moment in these kids' lives. Um, but I was invited, um, I wanted to do something more. And, and I, you know, I've been trying to work in, in getting into political adventures um, and uh, things here, but uh, I had an opportunity to come. I've just recently moved to a city called Ufa in the Bashkiristan, uh, Bashkiristan region. Um, and, um, it's the largest region in Russia with um, by population. And they have, you know, there's a very, it's out where near the Ural Mountains and there's a, there's a huge need for, um, you know, a lot of infrastructure and a lot of, you know, help with, you know, a lot of like buildings and, and sports and all kinds of stuff. And I was invited here to um, like work with sports and, and work with children, but also um, it was my dream to, um, I visited many orphanages in Russia and um, I got an idea to have an orphanage and there's, there's a need for more. Um, I started an orphanage that's uh, sport-based. So, and this will offer swimming and horseback riding and I'll teach jiu-jitsu and um, there'll be basketball. We'll give these kids not just a place to live, a place to go to school, you know, a place for medical, but a place to like find themselves. We're going to offer chess and dance and like just even from my own life, like um, when I was lost, when I was, when I was small, I needed something and I, and I found it in sport. So we're going to offer sports and activities. So these kids that don't have parents, we're going to have loving, caring people working there, helping them out. But we're also going to have opportunity, an opportunity for these kids to find themselves and find we're going to offer everything that possibly imaginable that they could find some inspiration in something that they that is for themselves, not someone like doing something, caring for them, taking them to the movies. That's all great. But for kids really to be happy, they have to have something for themselves, that their self, that they do well at. They learn, they study, they train, they 
um, do something that they like, Hey, this is mine. I was, I was not good at this. Now I'm good at this and I'm getting better. And now maybe I'm competing or maybe I'm just doing for my own joy, whatever the case, but this is something that's my own. And they, they feel it's like the self-efficacy and, uh, and the enrichment that they feel is, um, you can't measure it. And it, it, I think it's a uh, key for kids happiness. Um, so I want to base this, um, orphanage on these these ideals where we're gonna find we'll do whatever we can to find a fit for each kid like find something that and not only an interest but in a, something that gives them inspiration something for them to strive for incredible i i love it champ i mean here i, I loved it before but hearing about it like that with a holistic approach i'm going to call it you know with um covering each aspect of how you can help these kids that that is profound so moving on from that then i mean just as one other aspect of 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 that sort of thought process as i mentioned earlier helping people has always been um it seems that it's always been something that's important to you but it seems your journey of giving back seems to have developed um, but it seems to have always been there, if you know, if you know what I mean. Obviously, like like I mentioned earlier, with working in mental health years ago, and I've seen other interviews where you've talked about different things over the years. And so this sort of concept of giving back uh, and of you know contributing and of making a you know a positive impact on people, and you know however you want to frame it, that concept, where does it actually come from um, with you? I mean, what is it something you've always had? Have you always had that sort of um, urge to help people or is it something that's developed over time or I just want to get into that a little bit more I don't really have one specific question but just the whole the whole concept is obviously very important to you um so let's go into that a, a little bit and what it means to you to to give back and to help people well um you know first I want to say my whole life uh, my whole adult life has been training doing like seminars training to do fights, doing jujitsu tournaments, traveling. It's been all about, it's been all about me. It's been all about like trying to win some, some events, trying to be the best at something. And so it's taken a lot of effort. Um, and I've had a lot of, lot of people, a lot of the American top team, um, some individuals from England, from, from Russia, from, from all over, especially my, my team, I said American top team, like have given me a lot have supported me all the way and um without any without their help i could have done all this so um but my but it's all been about to me you know so um now it's it's my time to give back um but i think you know deep down all this stuff has come from my mother uh, my mother um, was a nurse um and her she gave and gave and gave and gave and she loved it wasn't for her it was a um, passion. I wouldn't say like just a job. It was a passion to help people, helping people, going to making the effort, extra efforts and extra visits, the extra phone call, the extra, you know, bringing like a, just a cheerful hello. And um, she, like I, I witnessed this as a child all the way, you know, until she passed away, like her giving, giving, giving. And um, this is, you know, hopefully I got some of this, but I know uh, my two older children, now my, my son is a doctor and my daughter is working in, um, working in psychology with, with, uh, with helping children right now, like, like teenagers that are having depression and um, is going to nursing school. So she's in the helpful profession too. And they're both wonderful people who want to give, give, give. And they're doing this because they care about people. So, um, you know, hope it's like if you get... Uh, if you have the right person showing you like how you can care about people, then you know, hopefully you can spread it on. So, I mean, for my kids, I think this all comes from, you know, it's flowed through me, through my mother. So, um, you know, I kind of have her to thank for, you know, it's what's, it's what's important. You give back. There's a, a Leo Tolstoy, the famous Russian, um, most people recognize him. They, you don't have to be Russian. You know, Leo Tolstoy he wrote War and Peace, amongst other books. Um, but he had a quote, and I say I had it tattooed on me somewhere. It says, uh, the whole, the meaning of life as a, as a human is to give back to people, is to give to people, to help people. And I, I really believe this because um, we live this life, it's very short. And at the end of our life, um, you don't just want to have existed. Like, like I, had, I had a good time. I had wealth. I had a, a car, a house. I had 
you know, so had things, da da da. That that's no legacy, and it's it's no legacy, honestly, what you do, like on the sports field either, because it's like, oh, he won jujitsu championship four times or five times or eight times or whatever it is, or he was a champ, UFC champion two times. And it's, okay, that's great, but at the end of the day, after ten years, you're just a name. You're just a name, like, oh, who was a a champion back in it's just something they're going to write in some book or on some video saying oh yeah he was but the impact you have on other human beings like is like a throwing a rock in the water and it spreads and you never know how you know this is a quote from someone else but how far this this like uh this these ripple waves you know affect other people you affect you do something for a child, you do something for someone that's in need, they in turn feel good, they do something, then they do something and then it gets better. Somebody sees you do this or gets inspired by something you do or sees some kindness and then acts in a certain way and then that kindness is spread. It spreads like a, like a virus, except a good virus, you know, in a good way. And you never know the impact. But when you do something like win a championship or something like this, you might inspire someone to fight or something, but like you're you're doing something for yourself, but when you do things for other people, um, then it, it, the ripple you never you never know. Like you start a maybe we start this orphanage, it's gonna be there. You know, I hope and pray long after I've gone away. So long after I've gone away, that orphanage will be there. So that's what's important, you know, and that's gonna affect many 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 kids' lives, and then they're gonna. When they have children, it's going to affect how they treat their children, and then so on and so on. So, um, it's a, it's me. It's exciting, and it's um, it's you know something for um, you know something that's that's what you leave when you when you die. You left this behind, and and it carries on without you. Incredible. You know something, champ. I knew that would be a good answer, but that answer was so much better than I personally expected. And there's so many things there, but the ripple effect is, uh, or what I just call the ripple effect, what you just said, is a powerful thing. And it's it's really one of my intentions for this interview as a, as a creation of itself. But I'm really glad you mentioned that because um, I know I'm going a little bit off topic with this, but I've been talking to people about the ripple effect for years, you know, and to hear somebody else say it is actually a really lovely, um, lovely experience. But it is a powerful thing, the, the impact you can have on, on other people and the way you summed that up so simply and so concisely. And uh, yeah, Leo Tolstoy, love that guy. Absolutely. Uh, I've read uh, Confessions, um, War and Peace and the first one this is off topic now so i just i just want to but i might even cut this but i just wanted to say the one that had a really powerful effect on me i read years ago and it's in the death of um ivan is it iliac or I, i'm not sure how it's yeah, pronounced yeah. It. yeah he read that one years and years ago and it had a, and it had um really profound effect on me really it, some of his stuff and i've still got more that i haven't read yet but it had a really profound uh that's off topic that is but i just wanted to say that yeah, great the, my favorite book by him is uh the kingdom of god is within you Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. man. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, you'd yeah, recommend. It really hit home about, like, you know, I don't know if you're religious or not, but it doesn't matter. It just means, like, like goodness comes from inside you, so go, yeah. so don't wait to die. Don't wait around, like, waiting for something to happen to go do this and, like, you know, share it with other people. So it's, it's a good book. I'll put that on my Christmas list, champ, straight away. Uh, after, after we finish this, I will do. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's, it's good to have a recommendation. I've heard good things about that, about that book. Um, okay, so let's, let's move on with this then. So um, obviously I want to get into one or two um, fighting things and then, and then go back into, um, and I'm sort of talking, because, you know, sometimes I do these interviews quite chronologically, but this one is, is more in, in themes. I just want to give a quick mention the main fight that I want to talk about is obviously um, Fedor or Fedor, depending on different people say it. But and obviously you you um, fought in front of President Putin during that uh, that contest, which is incredible. I mean that's uh, that's an incredible achievement. And he, uh, I believe, personally congratulated you. And, and there's a whole story. So I just want to hone in on on that story a little bit, um, just because it's an amazing fighting story and. Um, then we can get into a few other things and then go back to the fight. So I'm thinking of going on and off. But I want to cover this one because you also fought with a broken leg. It was it was um, 
it's just an extraordinary fight. I remember watching it uh, a while ago now. Now, this is a funny one, Chad, because I don't really have like a like a really specific question about it, but just your experiences of the fights, what it was like to uh, compete against, you know, an absolute legend. I mean, absolute MMA god, um, you know, that, that he is and to compete in Russian, to compete in front of the president and, um, you know, the whole situation. So it's not really one question, but just your, your experiences of the fight, if you wouldn't mind sharing those, please. I think it's, it's an amazing story. Um, and you, yeah, your thoughts on the fight, please, champ. Right. Um, well, it is, it's probably, the, it's definitely the most uh, colorful and um, story written fight of my career because um, it's like the one of the worst fight and the best fight all wrapped up in one. Um, so I went to Russia like three months before to do the the, the press interview with Fedor. We entered, you know, uh, for M1 Global. And then when I came for the fight, I was there like a week before. So I did like a big master class, um, kind of meeting with people. We had, you know, several hundred people there. And then the day before the fight, um, I had, because, you know, politically, there's a bunch of anarchists and socialists and communists in Russia. And they're like, Oh my guy, here's a guy from America that's some, you know, like from the left. And they got a hold of me and they said, Man, can you do can you do a seminar for it? And I said, Yeah, of course. And so, but and so the only time I had was the night before the fight. So or the day, it's kind of the day, even before the fight. So I went and did a fight or the seminar and it was it got to be late and I couldn't, you know, I said I didn't know any Russian, so we had a translator, so it took, you know, a two hour seminar, it took four hours. And so I went to the, I got to the press conference um, and I missed it. And um, so I missed this, this whole big thing with Fedor coming in. And it was, it was kind of funny because the, my manager at the time, Monty Cox, he had, where I was supposed to be, like answering, he put a bottle of water there that was like supposed to be. So it was kind of, when I saw the picture, it was kind of funny. They were really, really pissed at me. But um, what are you going to do? So anyway, but the fight itself, um, so I've been wanting to fight him for years. Um, and the reason is, is because he was the best. He like, you know, people now, uh, guys, you know, go two or three years without losing a fight. And they're like, they're legends. And they're considered like, they get in the, the GOATs conversation, the greatest of all time conversations and stuff after two or three years. And this guy went 12 years, 12 years fighting the best in pride. And then UFC champions coming over from to fight in pride and beating them. He beat everybody. He didn't lose for 12 years. And he didn't have any close fights. No controversial decisions, nothing. He either like, finished them or like made it clear cut he won. And he beat all the Noguera in his prime, Kolkop in his prime. He beat everybody. He beat Tim Sylvia in 30 seconds. Like He beat all the top guys. Um, so I it was like, man, I watched him fight. And I was like, man, he's so progressive. And he comes in. But he doesn't, his wrestling's not the best. And I, I, if I take him down, I can, I can submit this guy. So I was really excited to fight him. I was like, man, it's, it's like a perfect matchup. Um, he's going to come in aggressive throwing punches. I have a good chin. I can take one or two. I'm going to take him down. And I saw, I saw him taken down many times where guys were on him for, for three, four, five minutes in pride. And they made a mistake and he like arm barred him or, you know, got up and knocked him out. I go, man, if I get him down on his back, He's not, I'm going to, I'm going to finish him. I'm going to choke him. He's not going to get up. I'm not going to, he's not going to sweep me. And um, so I went in this fight feeling really, and I trained really hard and I felt like getting coming really confident. Um, but man, the guy, you know, smart. He, he changed his tactics. He just, he made it a kickboxing match. And I think he knocked me down, like literally knocked me down maybe four or five times. So I was on my back, like days. And the first time he got on top of me, he started punching me. And I did my half guard sweep, almost swept him, and he got up and ran away. And then every every other time he knocked me down, he just he didn't even go to the ground. He just like said, "Okay, come back up." So he made this a three round kickboxing match. And um, look at that! It was a terrible, terrible. Um, you know, during a, what what the difference is? I tell people this when I ask, like Jeff, you were like world champion jiu jitsu, like you fought for the UFC title, like how. The difference is I, I was a very good fighter, but not an elite fighter. I wasn't, I was, if I won the UFC title, I could say I was elite, but uh, I was a step below the elite. At jiu-jitsu, uh, when I, I was the best. I, I was, at, for, for many years, I was the best. And the difference is 
when I fought jiu-jitsu, even if I fought a guy that was more experienced. And many times there were guys that were better, like technically than me. And I felt it and I could feel it in the first minute or two or three, like, I'm not going to be able to do what I want to do against this guy. I'm going to lose. But I, I, cha- I was able to change my game plan mid-match and, and figure out a way to win. That, that's what made me good, like at that level, the elite, the top, the best. In, in fighting, I couldn't, I didn't have that extra gear. I could fight my style and ma- most of the time I could be, I could be most people this way. But those few guys, the elite guys that wouldn't let me get to that, that point in the match or to that um, arena, getting it on the floor, getting them down, get to where I wanted to be, I couldn't, I, I didn't know how to change the gear into okay i gotta switch up i gotta do this i gotta do this i wasn't good i wasn't good enough for whatever reason i maybe i didn't i wasn't smart enough wasn't like athletic enough whatever it is i couldn't i wasn't able to do it and so in fedor math is exactly what happened if like looking back now i would have fought completely different i would have come in kind of like a chael sonnen come in throw punches clinch take them down for there I, i was like taking long shots um, I wasn't, I was just standing in front of him, getting kicked in the leg. He broke my leg, getting kicked in the leg 20 times, you know, getting punched and then coming in like a bear, boom, 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 bam, 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 boom, 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 boom. Because I expected him to come into me and I would take him down. I would, I would just lower my level, throw a punch, take him down and be no problem. But he changed. He, he, he was smart. That's why he's the best. And he was able to change tactics. Um, you know, he didn't have to change in mid-match. He had a tactic. He didn't have to change at all. He came out of that match. You know, I look at the, you know, you talk about the meeting we had afterwards. We came and talked to him. Like, he doesn't look, it looked like he did a little, work, like a workout on a bag. You know, he's sweating. He had a workout. But he didn't, he had no, no bruises, no bumps, no aches, no pain. He had nothing. And I had a broken leg, like cut up lip, black eye. And I was beat up, beat up, like beat up. And, um. If you just, you know, so anyway, um, but the good that came out of Matt's is it was my introduction to Russia and um, it went well with the people because, you know, I, I didn't quit, you know, went the distance. I got beat up, but still continued fighting. Um, after and then Fedor, who's the God, you know, he like said nice things about me, gave me the thumbs up. They had a you know interview and they, they had a picture in the paper of us together afterwards and all that made kind of headlines. So people are like, oh, okay, well, Fedor likes him, then I guess we can like him. And um, then after that, I had some fights, which were I was successful in and had some appearances. And, um, you know, a lot of it was just I was myself. You know, I didn't try to play uh, a role. You know, I'm an American, I'm a bad guy, or I'm a good guy, or I'm any guy. I'm just like, hey, I'm here. I like you guys are really kind and cool. Um, Want to, like, do this, do that. And, um, you know, so um, it just it just happened that I became introduced to Russia and had a lot of opportunities on the late show here and some other stuff. So I uh, got to meet a lot of people to help me out. And so it was the worst fight as far as like, you know, because it was my dream to beat him. It would have it would have been you know, on the level of winning the UFC championship to be the best of all time, you know, when he was still in his prime. Um, that would have been like a, a big thing. And like. It was in my. It was one of those things. That I think it was in my grasp. So that I was, you know, able to change my tactic a little bit. Um, but it didn't happen. But then afterwards, you know, a lot of things, everything good that could possibly have happened after a match that you lose, lose badly, did happen. Everything good. So it's a, you know, it's a bittersweet moment. Incredible though. Incredible to hear the story like that, champ. Because. Um... There's aspects of that that you don't see from, you know, from the outside looking in, so to so to speak. You know, I mean, there's things that you experienced that, that you know, the fans and people don't see. Um, and it, it's amazing to hear about it. And that's why I highlighted that one, because there's so many great fights that you've had. I mean, there's, you know, too many to talk about today. But that's why I wanted to highlight that one, because it, it seemed like a real... Um, Crossroads is the wrong word, but it, 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 you know, it seemed like something that really changed your life and, and, and 
you know, and you've highlighted that. And that's part of the reason I could tell there was some good and there was some bad, but it's such an amazing story. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you very much. But moving on from there, going back out of the fighting, then we'll come back into it for just a couple more afterwards. But one thing I, I also want to highlight here real quick is obviously you've been through a very um, political sort of, I don't know if to say a development. I mean, it seems from the outside looking in like it's been a development, but you really, as you mentioned earlier, you've awakened to, um, you know, an awareness of certain things. And I'd like to give this a mention because it, it, it's it's fascinating on a number of levels. And I think it's, I think it's purposeful for people to hear about um, not only that in itself, but also, you know, some of the experiences that you've had that I, that it seems contributed to that. Um, so, I rem for example, um, I remember watching one interview of yours where you described being in somewhere in Brazil and there was a lady there, um, you know, be um, begging for change, you know, for tiny amounts of money and the impact that had on you. And that's just one example. But, you know, maybe there's things like that that have come into your, your development. I, um, I don't know. But I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And again, it, it's a broad one, Champ. I mean, it's not really a narrow question because I feel if I sort of narrow in on it too much I, I miss something over here or over here because obviously you've had the experiences so in your own words I'd like to talk through a little bit some of your um some of your beliefs some of your involvements in um certain political parties you know anything you're comfortable to say and obviously some of what led to that you know some of the personal development you've been if that makes sense I know that's a um roundabout way to put it but if that makes sense I'd like to give that a mention because I know it's something that's very important to your life you're very outspoken obviously you've got some tattoos around it as well which I want to give a quick mention later on but in the meantime um let's talk about that your political beliefs what they mean to you and how they how they developed uh if that if that makes sense please well I mean my first kind of awakening or my first realization that um something was wrong in the world um was I remember I was in college, uh, I was actually a senior in college, and I was taking a social psychology class. And we had a guest speaker, my, my guest speaker was from India. And he came in. And we were talking, he, he basically talked about the money, the money spent for, um, you know, individual therapy for this, how it could be better used for group therapy It could be better used for, you know, a groups helping people, not just individuals. And then that led to questions and conversations regarding like where the money in the US where our money or tax dollars were going and how it was being spent on war and this and that. And I left like amazed, like, wow, there's like, there's worse, we're doing, you know, I, I was always like a go, go, go USA, go, you know, because of, because of sports, you know, I supported the US and hockey and track and field, like everything, like one is to win this and this and that. I thought we we're off fighting all these wars for good and do all this stuff. And because um, by that time, uh, the first Gulf War had happened and um, I had no idea about the war. I was like completely naive. And it, it just woke me up like, it, it, made me, it made me realize I didn't know very much. Like, like what, I understood, what I read in papers, what I watched on TV, wasn't really the full story what, and what I paid attention to it all to at that point, mainly sports and school and family. Um, so I didn't really look at the world. And so I was like, wow, there's a lot out there. I know, there's so much I don't know. Um, and then obviously the sports career, getting to travel um, and then working in psychology, seeing, seeing very poor people, seeing people, mentally ill people that I worked with um, that did something, some crime, some going into a store without clothes on or something crazy because they were um, schizophrenic or something like that. And then having court fees and, and debt to, um, you know, to pay back uh, their, for their misdemeanor crimes and this and that. Um, and wondering like, why is this person being punished? Like we're, we're extracting money from these people that don't have any money and, and making their life very difficult. Um, so this is, this was kind of my, 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 you know, getting working with psychology and people that I, I, I saw it on a small scale, working with like individuals. And, um, and then when I was able to travel, I was able to fight. Then obviously that story in Brazil, I, you know, I was at the Philippines, um, with, right when I got to the Philippines and got out of the hotel, there's, there's like four or five of us fighters walking and, you know, a group of kids, probably like six kids come up, you know, eight or nine years old and like, man, can you, 
and they didn't they didn't ask for money. They go, can you? There's a McDonald's down the road. Can you can you feed us? And we're like, because of course when we came there, we were warned. Yeah, don't give anybody money because they're gonna ask. So we're like, oh great, yeah, of course we'll we'll buy you because we know you're gonna. It's for food, you know. It's not for anything else. And so we buy them all these like happy meals, like six kids, and we sit down to eat, and they sit down like next to us, and they're just. They're looking at the they have like a little toy, they're playing with the toy. They're not eating nothing, they're not drinking the drink, they're not eating nothing. And I'm thinking, what the hell's going on, man? We just bought them food and they're not eating nothing. And then they're like kind of trying to excuse themselves to go. And I asked someone at the restaurant, I go, man, like, dude, what's going on? Did we do something wrong? We bought these kids. They go, no, they're going to bring that food to their families. Because their families don't have anything, they're probably they're probably begging for to bring food home. That's why they're not eating anything. So we're like, man, like, are you kidding me? So, you know, we bought them, we bought them another happy meal. So we bought them another happy meal. Then they started eating. You know what I mean? The, like they started eating because they knew they had something to bring home. So it's just I have like a hundred of these stories. You know, I've been in you know orphanages and in, in Russia and, and you know the Philippines or in Korea. Um, you know, all over in Brazil, in different places. And it's, uh, you know, it's like you see poverty and then, you know, I have a, um, I had a little property in um, Nicaragua and I went down there and I saw, you know, kids, like naked kids with diapers on top of massive garbage piles looking for some plastic or some bottles or something that they can sell or trade in for money for food. And, um, you know, I, I see like this is stuff that you see on TV on commercials, like, you know, send in your payment to, uh, to help these poor people. It's like I saw this, like for real. I, I, I it, you know, had some contact with these people. So this, um, and then of course, my question is like, why is this happening? And like, why am I staying at this, you know, four or five star hotel tonight? Because, oh, I happen to be a fighter. Like, I'm not contributing anything to the world other than like entertainment. <laughs> I'm an entertainer doing something for myself, getting a paycheck. And like, I get to go and work out like when I pretty much when I want and, you know, I work out hard, but that like, it's pretty, it's for myself and I'm getting paid good enough to not worry about these kind of things in a nice hotel. And these kids that obviously, especially when they're younger, you can't say, oh, they're alcoholic and they're drug users. They did something bad and they, they have themselves to blame. No, oh, these kids like, they had no chance from get go. Not, and the biggest thing, not to get off the subject too much, but like that, I, like I was, I became aware of it maybe because of a psychology degree, is because is these these kids, these these adults, these people who grow up in this poverty, and even in the United States, that you have a single mom, you know, trying to go into work, trying to like save enough to like help her like children pay for medical something like this. These people um, are growing up in, in some other Sudan that, you know, live in a little village and not having money. I mean, not even having a clean water. These people will like have no chance to ever contribute to society. I mean, they talk about winning the world jiu-jitsu championship, whatever, fighting for USC title or doing this. Yeah, but what? imagine how many of these kids or these people would have that opportunity if they had a gym to go to, if they had food, if they had water, if they had health care, if they could stay when they traveled, if they were able to travel, they got to stay at a nice hotel. Um, imagine what they could do. Imagine like maybe they're the next UFC champion. Maybe they're like some great scientist or um, some great teacher that inspires young kids to do something phenomenal. Or maybe they're, you know, they, they figure out some new way to build roads that quicker, a new like invent some other way to plant crops or something like all that human potential uh, is just lost. Like it's there because their whole lives are just trying to survive. Like the next meal, where are they going to stay tonight? How are they going to feed their child? Um, how are they going to pay off this medical bill that they got, you know, when they're, when they're trying to like, they got to pay a medical bill or they got to, pay rent this month and they don't know which, you know, what they're going to do. And so these people, like they, they can never like give back what the real potential is because they're just trying to survive. And um, when I realized this, that was like a, a, when I say awakening, that was an awakening moment for me. 
Um, and it, it's like, a, you know, it's just not fair. Like, because I, I have this chance, many people have had this chance. Um, and so we, as people, like, it's, it's really, to me, it's an obligation because I've had this opportunity now, and I've, I've had for many years, almost 50 years old, and I've had this for, since I was, you know, born. And so now I got to give back. And it's, um, I think there's, a, there's many people um, who, do, who do a lot more than I do, and there's a lot of people who do give back. But I think we need to kind of let the word out that there's, you know, a lot of people in need, um, you know, and then politically we've got like the system, like what, what do we need to do to change the system? It's not just about, you know, opening up a school or opening an orphanage or giving money or giving food, something like that. It's like, well, how are we going to change it? So these people have opportunities from the get go and they don't have to live in, or, you know, they don't have to be in orphanages or they don't have to not have this or not have that. So that that's ultimately the goal. But in the meantime, we've got to help the people that are in need. I mean, thank you for sharing the passion and power of your of your message and the meaning and, you know, those, those types of things. It's just an incredible thing. And um, I'm very grateful for you sharing that because there's so many things there. Like I say, it's, it's a whole conversation of its own. Um, and the aspect of them just trying to survive and they have so much more to give, um, I've observed, observed as well. And it's like... Um, you know, there's a Maslow's hierarchy of needs type of thing. And when people are just, you know, day to day and day to day, it's obviously they're, fur they're further down on the bottom end and there's so much more they could they could contribute. And I love that viewpoint on it. Um, but there's so many other things and, and having the experience as, as you've had, it must be so profound. And it's, um, I'm really, really grateful for you sharing that. Well, Another say, thing I, 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 I say something, Sorry, you, you, know, I hit on, you hit on some of the reports, like, um, like I'm, I'm aware of the opportunities I've had and I'm aware that I've been privileged. Um, and one of the privileges I've had, I kind of mentioned is I've been able to travel and see these experiences um, because really without it, without the opportunity to go to the Philippines, go to Russia, go to Brazil, go to England, go to like Thailand and all these different places and see this stuff. Um, like I, I really wouldn't have an idea. I really wouldn't it would all be some concept from a TV commercial or reading an article or yeah, having someone like just say, oh, like just mention it passing or saying, oh, that's, yeah, that's a bad situation. But um, when you can experience it, when you see it, then it makes a difference, you know, then it, like it kind of hits home and that's kind of what happens. So I would like, I think there's a lot of good people out there and a lot of people that would help out a lot. Um, a lot of people that can make a difference and, um, being able to travel or see these things um, that like, gave me an opportunity a lot of people don't have. So um, I just want to take advantage of that. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. And I'm glad you gave that a mention as well, Trent, because that you've obviously competed in, in so many countries. I mean, when you read the list, it's just, it, it's, it's crazy. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, but it's interesting to go deeper with that and hear about the perspective that it's given you and you know the, the different things. So there's only um, a handful more things anyway, literally, um, to cover because it's actually really cool that you know we've covered several things in one with some of the questions which I was hoping for we sort of sort of compressed them together which is which is good. Um, one thing I do I've got to touch on, um, Trump, which which I really don't want to leave this one out is uh, obviously some of your ink. You know some of the tattoos that you that you have yeah. are, are really really cool and really meaningful uh, as well. But some of them are, are really cool. Um, I got to admit I like the one um, on the back of the neck and, and there's a few but. Um, and when I was researching this, I looked them up and you've got the, the one um, Christian statement on, on your one leg, which is amazing um, and very, very true and very wise words as well, I must say. But let's just talk about a few, just, you know, give a quick mention to a couple of those, you know, some of the tattoos that you have that are the most um, personally significant to you, if that makes sense, and then some of the meaning behind them. I know there's a lot, so we just pick a, a couple that you know you'd like to to share. Um, and the purpose behind mentioning that is obviously just that it, it really gives um, a sort of a sort of physical highlight to some of what you've said, if if that makes sense. It sort of ties in nicely. So, um, yeah, tattoos. Let's let's talk about those. Um, what you know, what you have, and what are some of the most meaningful ones to you, um, please, champ. Well, I, I basically have like three different kinds of tattoos. I have like political tattoos. Um, I have um, family or like meaningful people in my life tattoos. Because, um, you know, I've, I've had some, 
meaningful relationship to my life. And um, I've got these tattoos that are um, some I've covered up, some I haven't. Um, but like that's covered. Like I kind of regret the ones I've covered up, and um, I'm glad I haven't some of them because uh, they're meaningful people in my life. And like regardless of if I'm still together or not with them, it's like so like they had an impact, a positive impact. Um, and then the others are um, just for fun. Like you know, I've got some crazy like like a snowman, a fairy, some like stuff. And uh, you know, it's fun now because my daughter. She's two, my young daughter from Russia, and she's uh, and she's now starting to notice. You know, she's noticed always the tattoo, but now she's not noticing that. Hey, that's a moon. Hey, that's a fairy. Hey, that's a, you know, uh, this or that's that or that's a like scary monster or that's a this. And so it's kind of uh, fun to like, oh yeah, this is. So she sees it, like like uh, have like a skull, like a skull of a like a skeleton of a like a like a cat like that cat bull you know a skull you know and, and she so she saw bull today at the at the mall and she's like it's called bill it's called bill in russia so bill 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 like showing my stomach and that's kind of cool but um yeah have a little of that 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 one you know some of my my favorite ones obviously are my my kids names handprints thing um, ha um footprints i have um, you know, there's some special women in my life that have a tattoo on me uh, several times. Um, and I have, um, you know, the, the one, the, the Russian one, I have the, the Mother of Kurgan, the Mother Russia, which is probably like my favorite tattoo for appearances. And it's Mother Russia with the big, on my leg, the big, with the, holding the sword. And that's, like a fantastic one. And then like the profound one that you talked about, the the quote from you know Jesus, like, you know, love God and but love each other as I've loved you. Um, which I think is like if like you can sum up you know my like you can sum up religion in that one sentence. Um so yeah, I mean, I've, I had a lot of tattoos by you know a few different artists. Um like a, a couple a couple of my favorite ones, um, you know, from Especially from uh, from Olympia, um, Travis, and uh, so yeah, it's just it's been a you know it's uh, some people get it for different reasons. You know, I feel good about them. I like I like you know the ones I have. I, I like because um, they it was they, they all represent some time of your life that was meaningful, or a person that was meaningful, or some political thing that was meaningful. Or is still and they all still are meaningful, especially you know when they're just kind of remembrances of that. Yeah. Oh, that is cool. I love it that they have meaning behind them and there's like a whole story, um, you know, through your life. And that's why I want to give that a mention. I've literally got, I think, I think two more things, maybe three, but let's say two for now. One thing I've got to ask you, Chap, is one of the last ones is obviously looking back on, um, I'm trying to think the way to put this over, but looking back on, on your life so far, and I know you've got big ambitions on the horizon, which I want to get to in a, in a minute, but looking back on everything so far, proudest moments, okay, so that's what I'm going with this, you know, your, your proudest moments. Now, a lot of people will pigeonhole that as the fighting proudest moments, and I know obviously we, we sort of moved past that with, um, uh, with the deeper side of things, but I'm going to include that anyway. But in your life, not just with fighting, but in you know, all of your life now in terms of the, the whole thing. What are some of the things that you're most proud of um, at this stage? And as I mentioned, I know there's a lot more to come and things like that, but obviously you've accomplished a lot, not just in the sports, but outside of it as well in, in a lot of areas. Um, so, yeah, I mean, simply put, I mean, what, what are some of the um, aspects of your life that you're most proud of now when you, when, you know, when you look back, um, if that makes sense? So, oh, um, kind of unfortunately, like, Growing up, I, you know, like I talked about my mom, very loving, very caring woman. Um, my, my, my father died when I was two, so I had a, a, um, a stepdad, and uh, we didn't really have a relationship, and um, I was very, very difficult. And so I tried to, try to, try to please the person you can't ever please. And so I was trying to please him, please him, and so. Um, that's how you know how I originally got into sports. Like, oh, I was interested, but like, oh, if I if I do well in you know school or I do well and win this thing, then he'll he'll love me in this. 
and obviously you can't win love like that if someone doesn't love you. So, um, so it made it, and it's, it's a, you know, that's a double-edged sword. Like at one end, it makes me never satisfied, which is good because I train. I still quite, you know, want to be the best. I train. I never am satisfied with. Does my daughter say hello, Willa? A uh, Lulu. Hello. <laughs> Willa's hello. My daughter. And um, yeah. oh, she wants to show her tattoos. Oh, okay. There you go. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and the other, the, but the bad thing, you know, the, so I'm never satisfied though. But I'm, but I'm also never. That's the bad. I'm never satisfied. So I'm never, I never go, you know, like even now I'm 49 years old and I, I don't sit back and go, man, that was a good career. I'm, I'm thinking about my next match. I'm trying to get a match with Gordon Ryan, like, cause I think I can beat him. I'm trying to like get into the world jiu-jitsu championships. I want to do one more MMA fight. Not, not for anything, not for money, not for anything other than like, cause I want to try to win. Like, and because I'm not happy with the way, you know what I mean? People are like, oh, you want to do the world championship? You did this, you did that. No, you know, I didn't like that was before. I'm talking about what am I doing today? You know, nothing. So I want to do this. So unfortunately, um, not to be a sad story, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. And so it's, I'm never happy. But the, the one moment, and because I was able to share this with my kids was, I won the World Grappling Championship, um, I think for the second time in um, Switzerland. And I brought my two oldest kids with me. And I had been, I'd been away a lot, um, training, just been away. Then they were in uh, Olympia, Washington. I was in Florida, in England, different places. And I wasn't there for them for, for, a, for a while. And so, um, but I, you know, I'm like, man, I got to be. So I brought them to Switzerland with me. For this world championship so we stayed in this hotel room together and just the whole scene and it still makes me teary to say like so i thought i made it to the finals and then i won and um just having them like watch me you know i win the, I'm the world champion and they get to my two kids the kids the people you know that i care about most of my life get to see it and experience not just see it like not to but experience it with me then we got to spend a few more days together, like in Switzerland, like that, like meant a lot. That meant a lot. To me. And um, so that's one of my, pro like, I still remember like them doing the, you know, announcement and raising my hand and seeing them in the stands. And so that was, that was probably my proudest moment, just because I got to share it. You know, that, that um, championship did, wasn't any harder or more special than any other ones, except I got to share it with my, with my kids. And, um, so that was that was a big one, um, and then you know I, I don't know I I hope you know I keep saying I hope my I hope my proudest moment is um, is still to come you know so there's so many things out there I want to do and get get accomplished and um, you know just like I said it's a good thing and bad thing I'm just not not happy with the way things are like when I want to you know make a change just go let's go let's do you know so. Like kind of like a rolling stone. <laughs> yeah. It makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And the last question, champ, because the very last one, because I know obviously I'm sort of eating into your family time at the moment, and I, I don't want to do that. So the last thing is obviously you mentioned um, um, future plans, and you mentioned you know there's still some big things to to accomplish, and obviously I know we've sort of talked about that with the orphanage, and we we have, but just to give um, I'm thinking about this because because it, it's an interesting one, just just to think of you know some of your longer term ambitions and um because you, you know what i mean we've touched on it a little bit here and a little bit here and a little bit here mm -hmm. through the interview but just to just to give that um uh a mention as well as the last one and then and then that's everything just you know what you're aiming for and some of what's driving you now and obviously to help people is driving you and obviously you know what i mean we've touched on it but the last thing in your own words what's um what's driving you now what's on the horizon what's sort of motivating you to um you know, your, your up and coming motivations from here as, as the last thing, please. Well, I mean, I, I just want to touch um, positively impact as many lives as I can. And I, I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, that's like kind of the idea with political and that's the idea of like being you know, now. Um, open, I want to open, you know, we're going to open two gyms here. Um, and then I want to go all over Russia, like especially Siberia, where you know, I've been in many little cities there. They don't have the money. They don't have the, um, 
way, the meeting, the coaches, the, anything else to set up schools, the experience. So my idea is to go to these different places and, um, and I've got you know, people on board now to, with this um, to go help them, these cities, you know, with the mayors and set up a free school, like a little jujitsu school, you know, with like guys like Khabib, stuff like that, you know, that he inspired a lot of Russians, like uh, especially um, to go out and, and like, you can, you can do it. He came from a very poor, poor background, you know, had to work hard and get, Learned everything that that he got, um, so he inspired a lot of Russia. But but he came from a region in Dagestan that that had at least the facilities. He had, he had the opportunity, even though he was poor, he had the opportunity to train and do these things. And a lot of these places don't. So that's that's my idea. Um, I mentioned before that um, sport isn't everything, and jujitsu is not everything. Martial arts isn't everything, but it's an opportunity that for some people that they can take, and maybe opening up a little jujitsu school will inspire or help coordinate the mayor of that or the, the government of that city. Okay, well, let's open a, a swimming pool or a basketball court or, or something else for to give some other kids some options that want to do different sports. So that, like, I want to promote in, in Russia, like opportunities for sport. And a lot of the, I get a big question, especially for my American friends. They're like, why don't you do this in America? <laughs> you know, you're, you're from America, just do it in America. And, and to be honest and, be, and simply put is I have a lot more opportunity here, you know, because people in America who know me are sportsmen, they're, you know, fight fans. And, um, but people who know me here are um, everybody. Like, so I have, you know, the, the, they know me and I have like, I have some opportunity. It's like, okay, if they know me and this, it's like, I don't care about a, a free, dinner at a restaurant because the guy recognized me I, i'm like okay well maybe you can help me sponsor opening this thing i want to do or giving this free class or doing this thing for these kids um so i have i have a lot more opportunity to do this when i first came to russia um where i started coming here a lot i was working with the communist party for almost two years and they promised me they were going to help me do all these things that i'm done talking about now you know open an orphanage going to different places, open up, especially open up all these little sports schools. And um, they said, yeah, just mentioned that the Communist Party, I said, absolutely, you know, we're communist. And almost two years of going to cheese and wise din cheese and wine dinners with these guys, going to like photo shoot opportunities and meeting like famous people and shaking hands. And they never did nothing. I was asking over and over, please, please, okay, I'll do this, knowing that uh, being used, but thinking, okay, they're, well, they're going to help me out too, open these things for kids. Never one time, never, never, the promises, promises. So I realized after all this time, like, okay, there's no communists, real communists here in the Communist Party. So I got to, I got to do this by myself. And luckily, uh, you know, like enough interviews, enough like this, thank you, and enough, um, you know, like on TV and, and shows and stuff like this, like I, and, um, I got the word out, like, hey, this is important for me. It's important for Russia, it's important for the kids. Um, so let's do this. And enough people like kind of heard this and that want to help. Like I said, there's a lot of people that want to help people heard this, that gave me the opportunity and was supporting this, um, this uh, dream I have of like opening these schools and opening the orphanage or, of going to all Russia and, and helping this stuff out. So that's that's my dream. You know, of course, I want to I want to match with Gordon Ryan. I want to I want to try to win the Jiu Jitsu World Championship one more time. Um, you know this, but that's all like my personal thing now. But it's all like it's really my my, my main goal is geared toward like uh, like humanity, other people, because I've, I've had my day. You know, now it's time to give back. Amazing. Well, I'm really glad we could give that a mention, champ. And, you know, I'm going to give this a, a quick mention now. Is Guys, anyone watching this, listening to this, um, if you're interested in helping out, if you know anyone who's, who is in uh, any way, shape or form with any of the work that Jeff is doing, um, contact details included in this, you know, hit him up. He's available on social media. Um, and also, guys, 
Jeff obviously teaches um, jujitsu as well and has a lot of classes going on. So that's worth a mention as well. Incredible, absolute world class. I mean, that goes without saying. So I just want to give that a mention for you. See, I mean, I, I won't take up any more of your time. So I know it's, it's later in the evening and you want to be with your family. And I, you know, I'm very grateful for the time. Um, don't know if you have anything else you'd like to say to any of your fans, any people watching um, at all. If not, no worries. But I always, I always give people the opportunity um, if they have any thank yous or anything like that. But um, Otherwise, we're all good. I mean, that's everything I wanted to cover um, and quite a bit more, to be honest. Uh, I know I think yeah. I said it would be half an hour, didn't I? <laughs> and obviously, yeah. you know, that's what's happened. But uh, I, any, I, I anything? Can, well, especially when we talk about like political stuff, so I can you know, yeah. go all night. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, it's good. I mean, honestly, I mean, thank you so much for being so open. Thank you so much for uh, obviously um, taking the time to do this in, in the evening as well. And um, obviously, very best wishes to your family, um, warmest wishes to them as well. And, yeah. you know, thank you for your time. I have one thing. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. So, May, I think it's just like, oh, it's a quick, interesting story. So, like, you, you're from Wales. So, yeah. I've been in Wales one time, and that's. Uh, I was with my friend um, Charlie and his daughter. His daughter was like 10. And uh, he's a fight coach. So I was there um, either preparing for a fight or training, something like that. And so there was a, um, a girl that I was just had met or like uh, in there, my Ashley. I really liked her a lot. But so I was like kind of communicating with her. And so we were um, driving around his house and he said, oh, do you want to go to a castle? So we're in England. He said, okay. He said, it, so we crossed over into Wales, just over the border into Wales. And when it, it was at night because um, it was just late. We we're doing stuff during the day, training and stuff like that. So it was late. It was like maybe 10 or 11 o'clock at night. And it was like one of the best experiences I've ever had. We went, so we, it's this broken down castle, I guess, you know, several, maybe a thousand years old or 900 years old. He said, I don't know. Um, and so the, we had to, go around they had like a little moat that was dry and we had to climb down the moat climb up because there was no they had like uh tours during the day but it was closed obviously so we had to climb we had went around where they had like or where they kept the horses we climbed up the wall and went into this and it was like so that all like the the ceiling or the the top had been rotted away and it was like a clear night and so the moon was out the stars were out and we we're going out. We saw where they like threw, put the spears where people were trying. They poured the hot oil where people were trying to get in the castle. We went in. I went into the the dungeon um, where they kept the, the people. And it was it was just it was like a, it was maybe like four and a half four feet tall. So you had to squat. You had to either be on your knees or squat down. You couldn't stand up in there. And it was just like one little window, like 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 uh blocked off and you could just see outside but just being in there for like 30 seconds made me like wow what torture just being in a small little space closed off from everyone with just stone wall around you I went to the banquet room but it was like it was the most eerie feeling ever like what like with it was something from like halloween like you know like the stars are out the moon you could feel like the spirits. You could feel all the history, the death, and the, everything around you, like all the history, all in one place. Like so much happened in this castle, and it was like like you could feel it in your bones. It was like chilling. It was it was like you could feel literally spirits walking among you. I'm not, I'm not into the ghost stories and all that. Nothing like I didn't see anything, but like I could feel the energy. I mean, there was definitely energy, and it was like. Like, I still remember that. I can still get that. It still gives me chills when I think about that. Anyway, so that was my, my experience of Wales, the one time I've been in Wales. It was like, quite a, like, amazing. That's amazing. That is amazing, actually. Um, that's incredible. First of all, I mean, when you go to some of these, these castles around here, you can feel, um, you know, you can feel that with some, not, not all of them, because, you know, Wales has, like, actually quite a lot of castles around. But, um yeah. There are there are a few in particular where you go in there, and even um, during the day you can feel it. But like I've been, I know I've been to some like in the evening and things like that, not as late. And you know you can really start to feel like that just a vibe. It's just a whole. It's it's hard to explain, but I felt it too. 
Um, and um, but yeah, I mean the history, the the ones where they've kept them not intact, obviously because they're they're like ruins, but where they've kept them as they are, because they, there are a few where like it's one of them is a hotel now that's a castle that's on yeah. the border. I've I've actually stayed in it, mind it was quite cool up the up the top. But wow. you know, there's a lot of that, there's a lot of that stuff. But when they've kept the the history there, um, and you can sort of experience that, you know, sort of as it was and and things, it's it's amazing. And it's even though um, I've grown up with it because you know visiting you know old castles is something we do and it's something I've done. But yeah, it, it's still an amazing experience. And when when you stand there and you and you look up like um what you were saying, it's it's amazing. And um, but yeah, the feeling I can definitely definitely feel you on that I felt that as well uh, that's an amazing story champ that's incredible absolutely incredible um, ah, amazing well hopefully you'll come back one day and you know I can show you some of the other castles and some of the other stuff we've got yeah, yeah. things it's, like it's that like you put me on your network like yeah I'd, I'd really love I miss I miss uh, some friends I want to see when I come visit so yeah if you can if you ever if something happens definitely I'll try to swim by so. I will. I'll let you know. A hundred percent. hundred and ten percent. Well, listen, I'm going to I'm going to let you go to be with your family, like I, like I've said. But thank you for the, the whale story. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Um, thank you for being so open. And, and I, I know you are very open, but thank you for sharing everything you shared. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And uh, I hope you have a fantastic evening, Champ, and I'll, I'll be you in too. touch very, very soon. Yeah, thank um, you for having me. I really appreciate it. No, I appreciate it too. Really do. Any way I can help, um, what you're doing, I will. You know, any any way I can. So, um, absolutely. So, yeah, it's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it so much. But listen, you have a great evening, and um, I can say once again, best wishes to your family. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Speak soon. Okay. Speak soon. Yeah. God bless. You know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please subscribe to the Simply Inspired YouTube channel and there'll be more videos coming soon.